I'm meeting today with Steve Ketter, a private investigator, among other various talents, with the Bedrock Protection Agency. So Steve, we're going to talk a little bit about using private investigators in domestic relations cases. Sure. But before we do that, would you just give them your contact information so that if those people watching, any of you would like to use the services of his agency or Steve himself, you'll know how to, they'll know how to find you. Sure. My name is Steve Ketter. I'm with Bedrock Protection Agency. Our telephone number is 801-713-3600. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. I've been a private investigator for 26 years. I've worked in almost every state in the U.S. I've done thousands of investigations, um, including about 5,000 surveillances. Uh, I've taken um, hundreds of recorded statements and interviews and worked many, many domestic Five type cases. 5,000 yeah. surveillances. What's the average length of a surveillance? Well, typically they're six to eight hours. Oh and so, God. yeah. Oh, well, that's, I mean, so he, he has paid his dues. And you've certainly learned, I'm sure in some ways, the hard way, how to conduct good and bad investigations and what constitutes a good and bad investigation. Yeah. Now, for those who don't know you, so you have, you've covered a broad range of investigations, not only domestic relations work, but in fact, more often than not, things related to insurance claims. Would that be correct? Exactly. All right. But that shouldn't strike anyone as unusual. There's, I don't know of anybody who specializes in divorce and family law, domestic relations, private investigation work. Do you? Not really. Yeah. You know, um, oftentimes when you get a call from an attorney, um, their case may involve what one would appear to be domestic type relations, but you also have other elements that fall into other things that private investigators do. So you may have some background, you may have some um, uh, additional surveillance relative to something else. Um, you could have an employer that uh, is tied in. And so it, it really is uh, with the domestic part, you have basically three different types, okay? okay? You have the infidelity part of it, then you have cohabitation, and then you have child custody issues. And everyone is different, and everything has a, a, a different uh, methodology in, in how to handle it. So um, with each of those, it can easily expand out into other areas besides just the surveillance or just the background. Good example, if you're having the affair with the employer. Uh, or if there's money involved with the affair or things like that. <coughs> you've got to be able to draw on other resources besides just uh, being good at 5,000 hours of surveillance, for example. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. And a really good point with the employer is oftentimes employers have specific arrangements or agreements or stipulations with the employee with regards to their fraternizing with other people on site. And so that may have some um, uh, human resource department issues. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you mentioned the, the money part of it. So any time you have a fiduciary transaction involved, it could relate to something else. And it could be with regards to child support or to alimony or something like that. And then if you have an employer tie-in or you have another third-party individual tie-in. So let's, let's talk a little bit about you bring an interesting background because a lot of private investigators, in fact, would you say the majority of private investigators may come from a law enforcement background? A lot of people will retire from law enforcement and then go into private investigator work. Is that your story? Yeah, that's not my story. Um, we do have a number of private investigators in the industry who come from a law enforcement background and who have that experience as a detective. They get there 20 years in, they retire. Uh, my experience has been, uh, I started out at 21 as a private investigator and um, I maintained that in the industry throughout. So I haven't been in law enforcement, you have a different perspective when you're not coming from law enforcement. Um, sometimes with the retired detectives, you have the us versus them mentality, and sometimes they have a tendency to treat everybody as outside of their little circle. Um, one of the important things that needs to be mentioned with this is as you're searching for a private investigator, you want to find the one that is the right fit for you. I am not the right person for every single client out there, and by, by the same token, um, a retired detective may also not be the right person. I have a certain demeanor that I uh, present to people and a very uh, casual conversation right. with them. It's easy for me to converse with somebody and not really give them some direction. And I can say that it shows because I actually came across Steve in uh, conjunction with a case where uh, he was hired by the opposing parties and, and their attorney. And so I just, and I did, I saw that. It was a different, it's like, this guy's a private investigator? And like, he doesn't act like one. And so it is. It, it, sometimes you may need or, or like that uh, law enforcement background, but it's not a given that every private investigator has that background. 
You're absolutely right. And there are some preconceived notions and stigmas that are attached to private investigators. And sometimes when you have that, you've got the retired cop that's kind of gruff and kind of in your face and telling you what to do. And then you have others that are just very casual and say, look, this is what I recommend. And so what we were talking about earlier is that um, clients really need to have a good expectation of what is reasonable and what they could get. And because, often, yeah, because what you see uh, in the movies and television, uh, you know, it's very entertaining and very enjoyable, right. but not really what private investigation really consists of. So uh, Steve and I, before we went on camera, we haven't scripted this out, but he uh, told me a couple of thoughts that he wanted to share with you that he sees uh, people hiring private investigators, some of their misconceptions and some of their expectations that you'd like to kind of puncture that balloon right now, not to because you want to disappoint, but just so that people have a more realistic idea. So where do you want to begin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, private investigators can do a lot of different things, uh, but they, they, they're not miracle workers and they're not magicians. The bottom line is um, you have to have some reasonable expectations about what you're going to get out of it. And good communication with the private investigator, um, relaying your story, getting their input, what I look at is there's, there's two basic things that will happen with a private investigator that you expect to get out of it. You're either going to make your pocketbook feel better or you're going to make your brain feel better. And what I mean by that is the pocketbook part of it, that's where you have a case, you have a matter needing a private investigator, and something that they do will end up benefiting you in the long run. It'll help reduce an alimony, it'll help with child support payments, it'll help with something that furthers your case in a positive direction saves you money, gets you money back, or something along those lines. Then on the other side of it, you have to help your brain out. And that's where somebody says, you know, I've got this suspicion that something is going on, I can't prove it, I don't really know, and then we come in. It's not really going to help them get any money back, but it's going to help them get a better idea and verify. And so it helps them sleep at night. You know, if you've got this nagging suspicion that something is occurring, and you've got no proof of it, sometimes people hire a private investigator and when they get that proof, it's like a light bulb has gone off and they say, this is exactly what I needed, now I feel better. We had a very specific case recently. Uh, it involved um, a, a woman who was either a suicide or a homicide or an accidental death. And the grieving mother had hired us and there was some concern about um, the investigation that was done and how it went through and our role- By, by law enforcement. By law enforcement, correct. Okay. And our role initially was to try and determine that it was either A, B, or C, one of those three. Well, when in fact we got in touch with law enforcement and we got a better grasp on things, what we found was that um, they had done a good job. They proved that it was a certain type, that it was likely accidental. It didn't really make our client feel comfortable yet, so we followed up. And we acted a little bit as a counselor, a little bit as an advisor, and what they got, this is very unusual, um, the, <clears throat> the medical examiner's office had submitted an initial report to the, um, to the funeral parlor, and that report indicated uh, possible suicide. As a result of what we did, as a result of our client pushing, as a result of very good communication with the medical examiner's office, they sent a subsequent report to the funeral parlor that said that it, the cause of death was undetermined. Now that is very, very unusual they would change that. But that little change in it and that advice that we gave to our client made such a difference in making them feel better. They spent money. Did it's it get yeah. them any money back? No. no. But it made them sleep a little bit better at night. And we still consult with them occasionally once a month just to check on and make sure because it's a long process when you lose a loved one. So private investigators' roles are not always investigative. A lot of times it's giving advice it's consulting and pointing somebody in the right direction. So segue then to the advice you give to people that think, uh, well, a private investigator <clears throat> is gonna blow my divorce case wide open. Uh, it can, but right. uh, are, those, are those occurrences common? Well, the perception that they can is quite <laughs> common, but you have, to, you have to be careful and realize that private investigators have some limitations. You know, we're not miracle workers. What we do, and a benefit to our clients is that we have the experience of knowing the shortest way to get something, the most cost-effective way to get something. Oftentimes, um, you know, we're doing some of the same things that the clients can do, except we do it with a license, and that license allows us protection from stalking statutes, for example. If we're operating as a licensed private investigator, um, and we're doing our job on a case, um, we are specifically by law exempted from stalking, whereas an individual doing it on their own 
may not be. The other thing is you want to be absolutely reasonable with what your expectations are. And the best way to do that is a really good communication between the private investigator, the attorney, and the client. And if all three of those, because each has their own expectations. The client says, I want this and I know this. The attorney says, within reason, you can get this and this. And the private investigator says, look, I can get you this. And, and they're not all the same. They may overlap, but they don't completely overlap. That's right. And, you, and you, you get the best possible outcome if you have communication with all three and each one decides, this is what I can do, this is what I can do. Because the attorney's role in this oftentimes is, I know this judge, I've been before him before, I know what evidence is going to work. And if the investigator doesn't know the judge, doesn't know the attorney, hasn't dealt with the, with, with the case before, right. They think a certain amount of evidence is going to work, and especially or a certain kind of evidence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, you know, surveillance evidence may work. Background evidence, for example, um, in a in a cohabitation case, what is the right amount of time for proving cohabitation? Well, there there is no answer yeah, to that. Yeah, it depends on what the judge feels it is under Absolutely. the circumstances. Absolutely, and there are certain elements that you can get with that, and that would be showing that the person goes in and out at will. Maybe they have a key. Maybe they have a garage door opener that's in their car. Maybe they do some outside work, some lawn maintenance, or they put the trash out. Maybe you see them there late at night. You confirm their vehicle goes in the garage and stays there. All of those things. But if you do that for three days, is that enough? Well, not necessarily, because they could say, I'm just visiting there. And as you pointed out before we decided to go on camera, you mentioned, look, if I happen to speak with the client, and perhaps the attorney at the same time, or one after the other, I might discover that the suspicious activity for which the private investigator is hired only occurs on Thursday. That's and right. so there's, and so if you're not told that, you might say, all right, well, you told me some things are happening. Nobody bothered to tell me it's only restricted to one day. So I wasted a whole week following this guy around or this gal around. But Thursday, I found something. By the way, here's a bill for five days or seven days worth of work. Right. So I think it's interesting. and. Uh, Steve, can, I'm sure you can confirm this, that it's not a given that when you get hired, um, a private investigator, any private investigator, will speak to the attorney. Right. Sometimes they won't. Yeah. And so it's good to find somebody like Steve who had said, look, I want to speak to all three people. I mean, all three people should speak to each other, the, the client, the private investigator, and the, the attorney if an attorney is involved, because you're going to shorten the investigation, you're going to make it more efficient, and you're going to be better informed as to what you're looking for and why. The lawyer's going to tell you, this is what I need, this is what I think will be the most important. The client's going to tell you things to help you reduce the amount of time or not chase uh, dead ends and things like that. And so, but you'd be surprised. I was kind of surprised to learn that. When I first started practicing law and working with private investigators, I, I didn't know what they did. And so I kind of left it to the private investigators from time to time to kind of do their thing. And I was surprised to learn that a lot of them were happy to just keep drawing their pay and say, well, I didn't get any guidance. It's like, well, why didn't you take responsibility for yourself? So Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Oftentimes you're going to have the individual who wants to hire a private investigator, doesn't feel the need to contact their attorney or didn't contact their attorney. And I always add the caveat here is that, look, we'll do this, and if this is what you really want, we'll do it. If you think that it's going to help your case, please let's get your attorney involved and get some direction here. Because what I mentioned before, when you're talking about, for example, cohabitation issues, what's appropriate, three days or 30 days? Well, you don't know. Every attorney is different. And we've had cases recently where we thought that we had enough information, and it comes down to something very simple, such as, and you have this, the judge prefers one person over the other. And the defendant or the plaintiff either has a certain amount of credibility that outweighs the other one. So we can have all of the evidence we need and we go in there and feel with it. So it's, it's just a matter of, there are a lot of circumstances that cause the direction of it to go a certain way, the length, the time of money that's spent. And it's really important to discuss all of those beforehand so that you know, you're not left with some a mountain of evidence that really isn't going to do you any good or right. in certain cases where you have the court only allows a certain part of that. That's one a good point. Of, one of the things I found out recently and, and I've known this but we had experience recently as investigators we'll do a whole lot of work, we'll interview a bunch of people, we'll gather evidence and we have you know a day's worth of surveillance evidence, uh, a number of people to interview. You've and got your photographs, you've got your, you've got your <coughs> GPS data, you've got all kinds of stuff. That's right, and when you get into court, you find that the judge says, okay, you can submit this, 
and you can have three witnesses and you've got eight minutes to get what you have to say done when in fact you have an hour and a half worth of presentation that's the way the court is and that's not just that's not an hour and a half of just rambling it's like look I can make this crisp I can make this compelling but I need an hour and a half now by yeah. the way an hour and a half in court is not an excessive amount of time I mean you can usually have typical cases take a day or two or more so an hour and a half from a private investigator is hardly excessive and yet you're all ready to go you can string everything together and make a coherent case and you have to boil it down to eight minutes and you didn't know yeah, the most important thing is being concise with the information and using the best stuff that you have from the private investigator. It's also from a testimony standpoint. I just testified, and I've, I've testified probably 50 times in different venues, every single venue you can imagine, from civil cases to criminal cases, from workers' compensation boards to adjudication boards, everything. And everyone is a little bit different, but the bottom line is you have a certain amount of time on stand to A, establish your credibility as an investigator, and B, present what you have. Before you lose your audience. So the judge is going to have a short attention span at some point, and even if you're doing wonderful stuff, if it's not being picked up, and for those of you that don't know, in Utah, uh, divorce cases are not jury trials. So you lose your judge. You might as well not have even bothered to say it because if it's not remembered, it's maybe fertile for an appeal, but then you're talking tens of thousands of dollars to appeal something you could have won at the trial. Level. Yeah. And another thing to keep in mind, you know, if you do have an investigator that goes into court and presents themselves, you know, they need to present themselves with a great deal of credibility that comes in fighting some of the stigmas that are typically attached to private investigators. We have this over the years. The stigmas are perpetuated by what people know from past history, what they see on TV and the movies, and everything that's bad and salacious about PIs. So the idea is we get on, stay, uh, on the stand and we're testifying. <laughs> Which is like a being on stage. <laughs> Exa exactly, yeah. Um, and so we have to present ourselves in a certain way and if we come across with a professional demeanor we have our reports and our notes there and even more importantly we address the court and the judge with the respect that they deserve. We, we're coming in there and if we need to introduce something, if we need to make a comment, if we're overstepping our bounds, make a quick request from the judge. Your Honor, may I do this? You make another good point too is that you know everybody has to start somewhere but if you have a private investigator who has been to court before, this is somebody who knows how to prevent, how to present, excuse me, him or herself, as opposed to maybe doing a great job of con conducting the investigation, gathering <coughs> wonderful evidence, and then tanking it on the witness stand, being disorganized or not knowing what to say or thinking, not understanding how the give and take of questioning and cross examination works. You can you can lose your judge again just by looking incompetent when that was not the case. You know, incompetent is one of the least things that you need to worry about. Being portrayed as somebody who has done something illegal or unethical is even worse. True. So you can be incompetent on the stand and still have some video that carries what it is, but the moment you have that video and the opposing counsel says you've done this illegal or you've done this unethical or you've done this or this, it doesn't really matter how good you look, how well you present yourself or what evidence you have because your credibility is shot. So it's really important to hire an investigator that is ethical, that is responsible, that is going to look to the fact that their evidence is going to be introduced at some point. Is that a given when somebody is licensed as a private investigator? Absolutely not. Okay. Now, now this is something we did not discuss before, but I'm pretty sure that Steve's good enough on his feet where he can tell me this. How often do you find that the private investigator's work shuts litigation down? because it's so good. In other words, you say, hey, you know what? If we go to trial, we're prepared to show this, and that ends up settling the case, or getting the case settled. Yeah, absolutely. Often, quite often, I would say, because the amount of times that I actually go to testify that come in there is entirely disproportionate to the number of cases that I work. So oftentimes, what you have is the investigator is not gonna ultimately present this in court, but they are going to present it to the attorney and how the attorney uses that information in the negotiations is critical in getting that case dismissed or settled or something to the like. Most often in the insurance matters where you're talking about some type of insurance fraud typically involving a personal injury claim, you have that more often than not where you have the claims adjuster that says we know this, we know this, we know this. In the domestic cases, you have that similarly with child custody issues when you bring up some piece of background. Yeah. So it's really important that the investigator's report and information marry up right with the attorney's strategy on how to present that, and then oftentimes you can settle that before it goes into court. The, the instances of me going into court and testifying on things, it's very infrequent, almost rare that I will do that now. However, in those rare instances, 
You need to have somebody that you know it puts on their A game that is right yep. there can testify. So yeah, I had a I had a case where the private investigator didn't do everything we needed, but it was a very impressive binder. Right. It looked nice. There were some nice color photographs. There were some logs. It had the appearance of being a lot tighter than it really was. And then he got made. And it wasn't his fault, in fairness. But he hadn't done everything that we wanted and could have. And so what we had to do is we had to sell this, in, this at the uh, pre-trial stage because we thought if we go to trial, we probably could lose. And we were, and we were able to uh, essentially bluff by saying, we, we knew that she was cohabitating. But we were afraid we might not be able to prove that in court. So we presented it to the ex-wife saying, we've got you dead to rights. And this is just the tip of the iceberg from what we have from our, our private investigator. And she folded. Yeah, you know, uh, private investigators aren't needed on every single case. But That's developing a good, a good strategy, I'm huge on that. I think a good strategy in how to present it, oftentimes you can take information that you have. And if you're 75% of the way there, you can purport or you can indicate that you're 100% of the way there when you're in your negotiations before it goes in there and you can say we have it and if you feel a little shaky on it you can still do that and oftentimes it'll end up working because what you have might just be enough to tip them in the favor of settling. And do they want to take the chance? Do they really want to call that bluff? That's an interesting thing that you can use because like I don't have to show you everything right now but if this is what I'm willing to show you now Imagine what I could come up with or something like and, that. And, you know, the good thing is dealing with private investigators, um, if you deal directly with the attorney, you have that ability and that discretion by the attorney to use or not use the information. If we deal directly with the client and we end up bypassing the attorney in any way, there's a possibility that they can call that information in and it's not protected as work product. That's you true. know, if you're with the attorney, there's no attorney client privilege per se with private investigators, but there's an attorney client work product and you can protect that so you can limit what access we have if it's done. So does that mean that the attorney is the, is the private investigator's client the, so that the, the uh, let's say that the, the, the client client of the attorney pays the attorney the money to hire the private investigator because then the private investigator has that relationship, that work product relationship with the attorney. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so? absolutely. And that's probably the best way to do it. You have the client pay the attorney and then the attorney pays the private the investigator. investigator. Right. And then the information they collect, you know, 15% of it may be beneficial to the case and that might be what you want to introduce. The remaining 85% of it may be important but not really anything you want to introduce and you certainly wouldn't supply it to the other side unless it's going to be something to testify. Okay, good. Another good segue. Why should I pay for eighty-five percent uh, work product that isn't going to be terribly useful? Yeah. Why can't can't you just give me my fifteen percent? Right exactly. That's a really good point. <laughs> the problem is you never know, and but by the same token, that fifteen percent is absolutely crucial and worth every dime of it. I also do protective work, and I'll just give you an idea, a, a story that kind of parallels that. Okay. 99% of the time when I'm doing protective work, I'm billing at a bodyguard rate at a very high rate of pay, okay? And absolutely nothing happens. So they are not paying for that 99%. They are paying me for that 1% of the time where something happens and I need to take action and that is where I earn every single right. dollar of the pay. Same thing with this, that 15% is a very small portion of what it actually costs overall but it's absolutely crucial when it comes into play. Yeah, and it shouldn't come as any surprise. I mean, you can tell if your private investigator is just milking you. But let's face it, that private investigator, we were talking about this beforehand, you can, you can do, well actually, clients can do most of what you can do. There's a few things, and I thought it was very candid of Steve to say, uh, that there are some databases that only you can access. There are some um, uh, information brokers only you can access or would know about. And there are some things that only you can do from a legal standpoint that private citizens cannot. But what's really important here is that you have the patience to go sit in your car all night long with binoculars trained on this door or this park bench or something like that. How many people are willing to do it? It's not that they couldn't do it, but so you, you, you may sit all day long and find nothing that day but it's when you finally did find something because you were willing to put in the time and have everything covered that you got that gold. That's, that's absolutely right. That's a really good point on things. A lot of times 
we are uh, we're faced with a lengthy period of time we're sitting and waiting and sitting and waiting and because you do that because you take that extra uh, house that you need to go check out and that talk to that person and it's late at night and it's the last minute thing and you're thinking I don't want to do it but you go ahead and do it anyway and oftentimes it's that one little extra step that you take that that really makes a difference and it was only an hour's time and in the and with that though you just saved yourself years of alimony or something like that and the total bill might be five thousand dollars and all you needed was that one hour you would never have found that one hour's evidence if you hadn't been working the case all that time so give your private investigator a break I mean they have to work hard they have to spend time sometimes it's just a function of time that's right it's not a, I mean if you if the private investigator knew exactly wh when and where something was going to pop up you would actually charge the same amount of money right. just all up front. Now let's talk about that as, our, as we wrap up. Uh, people want to know how much it's going to cost and even though we talked a little bit about how long it's going to take is really a function of your judge, your circumstances, but still give us kind of an average. What, you, what do you think people should be paying for good private investigator work and how long will a private investigator in a domestic relations case need to get the evidence uh, to, to determine whether there is evidence or, you know what, looks like there's really nothing we're going to be able to find here, either because there is no case or because the person we're dealing with has covered his or her tracks so well. Yeah, the, the good thing with that is if you do your discussions in advance, you get a better feel for it. Everyone is different. Our investigative rate is $95 per hour. It's, okay. it's on the higher that, end. Okay, that isn't the higher end? It, it is on the higher end. You can get it for a, a, a less expensive with others. But one of the things that we offer, and we feel it's a benefit, is that we sit down and meet with them and we go through the strategy of when the best times are to put it on and how much to spend and what kind of budget they have with people. And so um, on domestic matters, if you've got a $300 budget, oftentimes that will not get you the amount of work that you need and the results that you need. But you could be spending a um, thousand, two thousand, or even up to five thousand dollars over the course of the time. And you have to weigh that against what the value of the, the case is. And if there's a significant amount of alimony over a significant period of time and you suspect something is going on, maybe you need to do some regular budgeting of investing in a PI for this amount, this amount, this amount. And so every case is different and every case requires something different. And, and I just really think that um, if you have good communication and you figure out a budget that works well with your clients, budget, mm -hmm. um, then you can accomplish what you need to. Because it is something where you can tailor the uh, complexity and the amount of work you do. And you might say, that's a little bit of money, I'd frankly like to do more, I think I could be more effective, but for what you're willing to pay, I'll give it my best. It won't be as much as I could be doing, but I'll try to, I'll try to be as resourceful as I can with the budget you've given me. Yeah, and, and oftentimes it's just a matter of asking somebody, what do you think your budget is on this? And mm -hmm. they tell me, I've got $2,500 or I've got $4,000 or whatever to spend on. And I say, okay, this is what I think we can do with that and this is what I recommend with that. And so it really depends. Some cases are over quickly. Some cases have a very narrow scope of what we're looking at. We need to prove on Thursdays this occurs during this period of time. Others are, I have absolutely no idea, but I suspect there's problems mm -hmm. and I suspect this. And so... We just, we, we factor in the best budget we can that works within a client's parameters. And Another out of the blue question, but I think he's up to it. What if you really feel your private investment, I mean, you honestly feel, despite whether you're happy or, uh, or <coughs> displeased with the result, that your, your private investigator robbed you. Right. This private investigator was lazy. This private investigator was incompetent. This private investigator was dishonest. Right. Where do you complain? Well, the first thing you do is you go to the private investigator and try and resolve it with them and say, look, this is what we agreed on, this is what you charge me, I don't feel I got it. And most of the private investigators will end up saying, okay, let me make this adjustment with you. Is I that just because they want to avoid a fight or because they are humble and willing to admit when they make a mistake or is it a combination? Or? Well, it really should be because they're good business people and they're honest people, that should be, because not everybody is gonna be satisfied with what you do. If you put in a good effort and you do what you say you're gonna do, there still could be some complaints. So with that, the first thing I would say is try and work it out with the private investigator. Okay. If you can't work it out with them and it doesn't work out, we are all licensed by the state of Utah. We're licensed through the Bureau of Criminal Identification. You can go there. Now you can't make an informal complaint, but you can make a formal complaint. And the formal complaint is, hey, I'd like to, and you fill out a form and you submit the information and you feel like you haven't gotten your money's worth. Now, if you paid a certain amount of money and they 
didn't do what they said they were going to do, that's one thing. If they didn't get the results that you wanted, that would be that's different. That's a different thing. Yeah, so you may have a, so it's a matter of working it out with the investigator first, then you can go to the, the Doppel and file a complaint, and if they feel, for example, if I have a client that gave me a thousand dollar retainer and I did absolutely no work, and six months later they said, you did absolutely no work, and I didn't agree with them or I didn't produce anything, they could file a complaint and the BCI would come after me. Mm -hmm. Or I can say, yes, I did, here's the work, and show it to them, and, and then it And BCI can, can they order you to pay the money back <coughs> or, or suffer consequences, or can they just sanction you, but then you, you, you don't have to give the money back? In well, it gets, it gets investigated, and then there's so an assuming, investigator working. Assuming they investigate and say, yeah, you know what, six months, a thousand bucks, you didn't do anything. Can, they, can, they, can BCI tell you, give the money back or there's going to be trouble? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, and quarterly there's a meeting on the licensing board. I happen to be on the licensing board for bail enforcement agents, so I'm the state licensing board. Those things come up, and they okay. come up with a PI board where the pre presentation is made that this person didn't do this, and the board can say, look, we're going for a one-month or three-month suspension on their license, and we are ordering them to pay this back, or we okay. will revoke their license. So, yeah, there is recourse if the clients don't get what they... Right. W don't get what they paid for, as opposed to the, the desired right. outcome. Right. Okay. Last thing, then, we're talking about domestic relations, your average domestic relations case for which a private investigator is useful and hired a week, a month, a year? What are you talking about? I, on average, knowing that every case is unique, can you give us a ballpark figure? Yeah, although the time frame um, is a little bit different, let me just clarify that what I'm talking about in time frame. If you do about a week to two weeks worth of work, not necessarily all bunched into one week, right. but if you do, you know, 10 to 14 Seven days, days worth of work over a three month period. That's right. Likelihood, some of those are there. In the larger cases where you need a little bit more, but what you're looking at on the domestic cases are certain times of people living together or domestic relations or situations and proving this and proving that. And so it's not all bunched into right one day, start on Monday and we finish on the following Sunday, we've got our seven days. And you're in. not paying for every day just as it passes on the calendar, it's the days that you work. Not necessarily. Yeah, and, and interestingly, uh, people don't always understand how that, that works. We get a retainer on something and we work off of the retainer. And it doesn't mean that the very first day we're working eight hours and now they're, you know, $800 into the retainer. It's maybe the first day it's four hours and then the third day we do another two hours and then the fifth day we do another full day of eight hours. And then we, you know, so it, okay. it's really dependent on that. And this is why I can't stress enough some good strategy and planning on the direction of the case is most important because nobody has an unlimited budget. Then let me, let me ask you this though. If you can't spend X number of dollars, <coughs> private investigators probably out of the question, what is X? Solve for X for me, please. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> well, let's back up just real quickly. What type of situation are you talking about? For example, your average, I mean, like I said, this is only an average. I'm not holding him to this because it's each case is unique. But what I, for example, people ask me, what can I expect to spend on a divorce case? And I would tell them, hmm, if you're not prepared to spend at least three to forty-five hundred, three thousand to forty-five hundred dollars, then you will either end up having to do this yourself or hire an attorney that is of questionable competence. Can you? I, the reason this is important to me is because I want people to know after watching this video. Ooh, I'd really like a private investigator, and I have, like you, I have three hundred dollars, and that's it. That's that's finding coins under the couch cushions. They've scraped it together. Are they going to get much help from a private investigator? Yeah, um, probably not, unless so, it's a very narrow, specific right. question. Right. So, what should the average person who hires a private investigator in an average middle class, you know, not not a multimillionaire and not uh, uh, you know trailer trash, because those people are. It, the, the multimillionaires can pretty much do whatever they want. And then the, the people that are really poor, it's like, well, there's probably nothing worth getting a private investigator for anyway. Right. So for the people that are in that situation, let's, t let's talk about that. I mean, hey, I could be on the hook for high tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in alimony. Right. You know, either, either to get or receive, I mean, sorry, pay or receive, or um, it's, 
my, my spouse is crazy. My spouse is abusive, but so good at hiding it. Right. I, so stuff like that. What should that person be prepared so they won't be shocked when you sit down with them for the first time? Yeah, most of our budgets end up being in the fifteen hundred dollar range, and that that that's gives a good bad. start. And that's oftentimes that's getting bad. the results. You know, um, it, it really depends on the direction, but sometimes. They go a little bit higher than that, but now, if you're not prepared to spend fifteen hundred dollars, sure, give you a call. That's You'll right. be happy to meet with them, right? But you may not be making a, a deal to be retained if they're not prepared. Well, you know what? I meet with I meet with anybody and just give them some ideas on what they can do with their budget and what you they know. recommend. And it's you know it's really worth it to me because oftentimes you know their perceptions might be a lot greater than that and what they have to spend and what they need. And I and I narrow it down a little bit, so I'm. I'm convincing people not to do things that are unnecessary that aren't going to help them, but convincing them the best way to spend that $1,500 and maybe some of the stuff, maybe a third of the things they can do on their own. Like if, for example, intelligence about what's going on. Get me the names, the address, the license plates, the photographs. Things that you shouldn't have to reinvent right. the wheel to get. Is there a Facebook account? Do they have other social media accounts? Are there different pieces of information? If they do that and they update me, then I'm not billing for that. I'm billing for the things that they can't do. All right. Well. It's important you make an informed decision, and uh, you've helped people to make a far better informed decision as a result of our conversation. Before we go, just one more time, give them your name and your business information for those that would like to talk to you again. Sure. I'm Steve Ketter. I'm a private investigator. I'm with Bedrock Protection Agency, and our number is area code 801-713-3600. Thanks so much. Thank you.